In fact, when the bombing occurred, one of the mothers of uh, one of the young girls called my mother and said, uh, can you take me down to the church to pick up uh, Carol? I, you know, we heard about the bombing and I, and I don't have my car. And they went down and what did they find? They found limbs and heads strewn all over the place. And then after that, uh, in my neighborhood, all of the men organized themselves into an armed patrol. They had to take their guns and patrol our community every night because they did not want that to happen again. I mean, that's why when someone asked me about violence, uh, uh, I just uh, I just find it incredible. It, because it, what it means is that the person who's asking that question has absolutely no idea what black people have gone through, what black people have experienced in this country since the time the first black person was kidnapped from the shores of Africa. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Town Hall, a Black Queer podcast, the podcast where we journey through a theme by sharing stories, music, poetry, and art of varying depth and hilarity. And today's episode is part two of Historical Icons and Activists. Yes, honey, it is a very special episode in honor of Black History Month. And last week, we just talked about some truly amazing activists. And this week, we're ready to, to get into round two. I mean, we can't cover all of the phenomenal amazing activists who have who have lived and are still alive, which you will find out in this episode, to this very day, um, who have made our lives uh, better for just existing and, 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 and tirelessly working, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Do you think we, we could I, never. You know, Pep, I think you're going you're gonna to be in, you're going to be in the books, Pep. How do you feel about that? You're going to be in the books, honey. One day. Yeah. We're, we're, we're a little young to be in the books now. <laughs> Am I dying? No, I mean we're a little young. No, you're a little you're a little young to be in the books now. But I mean, you are the first openly trans person to originate a role in a Broadway show, um, which is that can never be taken away from you. When you're the first, it can never be taken away. When you when you like break a record, they can be taken away. When you're the first one, they can never be taken away. And obviously, anyone who's ever just uh, breathed a breath in a nightclub in New York City knows the impact. Uh, I mean, people are still telling your jokes and doing your bits and, and uh, in, in the clubs to this. I've seen girls. I'm like, that's a peppermint bit. <laughs> I better go collect my dollar. Um, wow. Well, I think that we're both, I think what's so great is that we both have the opportunity to make like an impact, right? And I, and I can always think back to, by the way, those of you that just tuned in, this is episode two of, of this two-part series on uh, our Black cultural icons. And um, the clip that you just listened to was a clip of Angela Davis. Um, and, but I think that, you know, we all have an opportunity to make these sort of impacts. And I, I think back to um, Octavia St. Laurent, uh, when in her, in her, one of her many interviews, but one interview that was in um, Paris is Burning, when she talks about how everybody just wants to make an impact. Um, actually, she and also Dorian Corey, the 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 uh, infamous Dorian Corey, um, both talked about people like as black queer folks wanting to the opportunity to make an impact, and people just want to sort of be remembered. Um, and I and I think I agree with that. I think that people want to to make an impact. Not that that's what people are focused on, because I think a lot of our icons that we're talking to talk about today, um, and that we talked about last week are, you know, we're, we're doing what was right and really focused on sort of j justice. But, um, yeah, you know, uh, I think we'll both. Well, sometimes wanting to make an impact isn't about your ego. It's about the, the, the culture. It's about mm -hmm. the movement. So a lot of these people, they're not doing it for the glory. Actually, I, I can't speak to whether or not they were doing it for glory. And, and quite frankly, I don't care if they were doing it for the glory because it still moved the needle forward for justice regardless. Mm -hmm. So if, even if, even if someone, even if some of the people may have, been, may have had selfish reasons, they still did selfless things that help people who are not even themselves and who they never met and who will never, whose names they'll never know. I mean, know. think about this. I I've done some, some a couple of things. Maybe somebody remembers a few years later. But even the things that I've done, for the most part, have all happened like that. Anybody remembers are all things that have happened, you know, in the past like five, six years. A lot of these people were doing things 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. 
Mm-hmm. That is a long time for their yeah. legacy to still last, which is great, you know? Um, I'm really excited to talk about our, our first person. This is someone that you and I have had the honor of actually speaking to and interviewing ourselves. This is probably one of the, truly one of the highlights of my career. And if you want to go revisit, you can go to um, the first ever Black Court Town Hall, the third day. Um, Mo, um, <laughs> I almost said Monet. I don't know why I keep saying Monet. I don't know why. Because you're my best friends. It's because you're my best friends, Pep. It's because you're my best friends. And I love you both so much. <laughs> Um, you're my best friend. Um, but, um, you know, Pep and I, and of course, a lot of other people over at Black Queer Town Hall worked tirelessly. And we, we Round the I clock. remember being really exhausted. I thought we were going to pass being out of exhausted. whatever. <laughs> I think we, we probably did pass out a few times. There, were, there was, it was like crying and tears and, and laughter and, and joy. It was really, really beautiful. And this day was a day that we, me and Pep, we were like kids in school. We were like kids in a candy store when we were sitting in the Zoom meeting and preparing for this remarkable woman to pop up. So Pep, can you please tell us a little bit about our first icon of episode Absolutely. two? And I do want to, uh, to add that th- what we learned from her was just the tip of the iceberg with what she what she continues to deliver. Um, and so, you know, I hope that you all, after um, hearing about this, after the episode, go, go and uh, find out more about Angela Davis, who is our cultural icon right now. Here we go. I'm going to tell you about Angela Davis, who is a towering figure in the realms of political activism, academia, and social justice. Born on January 26, 1944, my Aquarian sibling uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, Davis's upbringing in the racially segregated South deeply influenced her commitment to fighting for civil rights. Uh, As a scholar, she delved into issues of feminism, Marxism, and the prison industrial complex, becoming a leading voice in the Black liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s. Involved in various radical organizations, including the Black Panther Party and the Communist Party USA, Davis's activism reached international prominence in the early 1970s when she was charged with conspiracy in connection with a prison break attempt. Her subsequent arrest and trial sparked a global campaign for freedom, for her freedom, with supporters rallying behind her uh, slogan, Free Angela Davis. Despite facing immense pressure, Davis used her platform to speak out against racial oppression, state violence, and the prison industrial complex. Davis's queerness has also played a significant role in her life and activism. While she has not always overtly publicly uh, been public about her relationships, she has spoken openly about her bisexuality, challenging societal norms, and expanding the conversation on intersectionality within the civil rights movement. Davis's enduring uh, legacy and impact resonates today as her work continues to inspire activists worldwide in, her, in, her, in their struggles against racism, sexism, and state violence. Her calls for prison abolition are trans- and transformative justice are particularly relevant in current movements for criminal justice reform. I got to tell you that our, our just brief, brief, brief interview of Angela during our Black Queer Town Hall uh, um, program, uh, we're just really the tip of the iceberg with what this woman has contributed and and the legacy and the impact that she's continues to have. She's still she's still speaking. She's still doing interviews and she's still creating and writing and and delivering speeches. Uh, and a lot of the things that she says that were historic are very, very, very relevant to the conversation today when we talk about the prison industrial complex and we talk about police brutality and the policing of uh, Black bodies. Of course, the, the murders of innocent, uh, unarmed Black men and women, uh, this conversation that really um, sort of came to a head at, in 2020. Uh, she, all of the, all of her work and writings and and um, quotes are very relevant. So please, 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 do yourself a favor and just go back into her her writings and her teachings because they are invaluable and they are definitely um, 
relevant to more than just the Black experience, if you ask me. Yeah, but the question is, more: how do you get there? Do you get there by confrontation, violence? Oh, is that the question you were asking? Yeah. See, that's, I mean, that's another thing. When you talk about a revolution, most people think violence um, without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. On the other hand, uh, because of the way this society is organized because of the violence that exists on the surface everywhere. You have to expect that there are going to be such explosions. You have to expect things like that as reactions. If you are a black person and live in, 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 in the black community all your life and walk out on the street every day seeing white policemen surrounding you, I. When I was living in Los Angeles, for instance, long before the situation in L.A. ever occurred, uh, I was constantly stopped. No, the, the, the police didn't know who I, who I was, but I was a black woman. I had a, had a natural, and, and they, I suppose, thought that I might be a, quote, militant. And when you live under a situation like that constantly, um, uh, and, and, then, and then you ask me, you know, whether I approve of violence. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, whether I approve of guns. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, some very, very good friends of mine were killed by bombs, bombs that were planted by racists. Uh, I remember from, from the time I was very small, I remember the sounds of bombs exploding across the street, our house shaking. I remember my father having to have guns at his disposal at all times because of the fact that at any moment uh, uh, someone we, we might expect to be attacked. The man who was at that time in con complete control of the city government, his name was Bull Connor, uh, would often get on the radio and make statements like, uh, 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 niggas have moved into a white neighborhood, uh, we better expect some bloodshed tonight. And sure enough, there would be bloodshed. Uh, after the four young girls who were, who lived very, who lived, one of them lived uh, next door to me. And, um, I was very good friends with the sister of, of another one. My, my sister was very good friends with all three of them. My mother taught one of them in her class. My mother, in fact, when the bombing occurred, one of the mothers of uh, one of the young girls called my mother and said, uh, can you take me down to the church to pick up uh, Carol? I, you know, we heard about the bombing, and I, and I don't have my car. And they went down, and what did they find? They found limbs and heads strewn all over the place. And then after that, uh, in my neighborhood, all of the men organized themselves into an armed patrol. They had to take their guns and patrol our community every night because they did not want that to happen again. I mean, that's why when someone asked me about violence, uh, uh, I just, uh, I just find it incredible. It, because it, what it means is that the person who's asking that question has absolutely no idea what black people have gone through, what black people have experienced in this country since the time the first black person was kidnapped from the shores of Africa. Also, I want to just add to this that Angela Davis is something of a fashion icon. Angela Davis's iconic Afro is one of those things that is burned into your memory. Um, I love the way she talks, her voice, the cadence with, with, with which she speaks has so much um, gravity um, and it just makes you want to listen. Um, she's a, a beautiful orator. She's, a, a, she's just so majestic and so smart and and I, and I cannot believe that I that I got to have a conversation with her. It's, it's wild. Kinda crazy. I my mom took me to see her speak uh, at the University of Delaware when I was probably like eight, uh, which is a way you know I was too young to really understand what she was talking about. But my mom worked at the school, and I had to be there anyway because she didn't have childcare. So I was like at school <laughs> um, and at college with my mom, um, and. 
But one of the perks was I would get a chance to go and hear a lot of these speakers speak, and they would often bring in, uh, you know, black thought leaders like um, like Angela Davis, and I got a chance to um, to to hear her speak and see her, and she still had her afro in the in the eighties when I <laughs> when I went to see her. Uh, yeah, so that, that was pretty I awesome. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have some. Uh some more amazing, exciting people to talk to you all about today, which is really obviously quite thrilling for me. Um, and this next one is um, someone whose book I listened to an audio book. I got to be honest with you all. I don't read the books with my hand. I mean, reading makes me sleepy. I don't know why. Reading with my eyes makes me sleepy. But if I can like walk and exercise and clean the apartment while, while, while reading a book, um, I certainly will. Um, it's just how I like to get my... And that's how you get your learning. Past me. And by the way, shout out, to all, shout out to all the audiobook girlies. Like some of us in these streets, just it, it's it's a lot to I sit like down. I like audiobooks. Like, sit down in twenty twenty. Who's who's sitting down in twenty twenty four? You know what? I think I think if <laughs> you if you down? if you want to get through the if if you're gonna get through the book, not that you don't want to absorb anything. If you want to get through the book, then you should listen to it. And then if you really want to like go like capture ideas from the book then you i feel like you kind of have to to read it if if there's like specific passages that you want to capture and like commit to memory and things like that um i just uh just ordered um both the hard copy like actual physical book but then also the audio book so i'm going to do both of uh cast um the origin of our of our discontents um it, uh, because I just saw Origin, the movie, and I was so moved. Uh, and so I would implore everyone to go and see that film while it's in theaters, like right now, probably won't have too much, many more chances because it was c completely independently made by uh, Ava DuVernay. And it's just, I think it's a beautiful film and the soundtrack is beautiful. The score is beautiful. And of course it's based on the book by, um, uh, Wilkerson, um, I can't remember, uh, Isabel Wilkerson, w yeah, by, uh, Isabel, cast by Isabel Wilk Wilkerson, um, and it's, uh, it's a great m movie, and it will lead you to the book, which is, uh, was like a bestseller in 2020, when we weren't really able to pay attention to you know, we had a lot going on in 2020. So for those of you who didn't read the book back in 2020, now's the perfect opportunity. Let's read it together. I'll be talking about it online. Sorry, didn't mean to hijack the conversation. Okay, audiobooks. All of that to say, <laughs> our second icon is James Baldwin. <laughs> James Baldwin was a trailblazing African-American writer, essayist, and social critic whose work focused on issues of race, identity, and social justice in America. Born on August 2nd, 1924 in Harlem, New York City, Baldwin emerged as a leading voice during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. His prolific work includes novels like Go Tell It on the Mountain, If Bill Street Could Talk, and essays like The Fire Next Time and Notes of a Native Son, explore themes of race, sexuality, and identity in America. Baldwin's queerness was an integral aspect of his personal and literary identity. Despite societal pressures and the challenges of his time, he fearlessly addressed issues of same-sex desire in his writings and publicly acknowledged his homosexuality. I don't think you all understand how big of a deal that is for the time in which he did it. Baldwin's explorations of queer experiences within the context of racial and social struggles contributed significantly to the visibility and acceptance of LGBTQ plus individuals and in literature and beyond. He... He used his platform to challenge societal norms and advocate for equality and justice for all marginalized communities. Baldwin's essays, novels, and speeches continue to inspire generations of activists and intellectuals to confront injustice with courage and compassion. Um, and also, um, James Baldwin is just one of those people who, I don't know what it is about him, but his face just stays with you. I don't even know how else to describe that besides saying, like, when you see, like, James Baldwin's face, like, it, he he has so much when, distinct, he, when, he, distinct when he talks to people. Distinct features, for sure. 
And when he's talking to people, it's really, it's just, I don't know. He, he, I love his interviews. Watching his interviews is really, really interesting. And he, he had, talk about the audacity. Obama talking about audacity. This man had a lot of audacity to be able to say the things that he said when he said them. Um, coming from a, a black queer man and people kind of couldn't believe he had the nerve to say it to their faces. People were really gagged. And is also someone whose voice, hearing him speak, you know, uh, the recordings of his voice um, were also really distinctive, you know, and yeah, yeah, stood out. There's something about those people of that time. They all had these, like, like Dr. Angela Davis, Martin Luther King, um, James, but James Baldwin. They always, they always had the, their voices are so. I don't even know what they what they, they they're they're not particularly similar, but they're just. People's voices were just so unique. I think what it is today, voices have become homogenized because we have so much access to each other all the mm. time. I think I don't even know. I mean, I'm I'm not a uh, anthropologist, and I'm not you know, I'm not I don't I'm not studying cultures and stuff. I think that um, these people to, to the degree that some of this professional would. I bet you there. I mean, that I think that definitely has a lot to do with the difference. But I think that the the reason part of the reason why people, especially folks of color and black folks, for sure probably spoke the way that they did. They they were certainly in the first of their generations to be as educated as they were. Um, and I and these are people who they witnessed their relatives literally dying for the rights to attend school and hold books and and literally be able to read without being punished, right, by law. And so I would imagine that the 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 ability to read and the because I'm sure they also were around people, especially from those from the South, who were still illiterate and not able to actually read. You know, we're talking about folks who were alive with us through the 50s, 60s, 50s and 60s, for sure, uh, at least the last few. Um, you know, that probably has a lot to do with it. You know, they fought for that education. So they were speaking it and, and delivering I mean, it every that. syllable, every consonant, oh, yeah. every letter. <laughs> White people go around, it seems to me, with a very carefully suppressed terror of black people. A tremendous uneasiness. They don't know who, they don't know what the black face hides. And they're sure it's hiding something. What it's hiding is American history. You know, what, what, it, what, it, what, it, what it's hiding is what white people know they have done and are doing. You know, it's what, you know, white people know very well one thing. And it's the only thing they have to know. They know this, everything else I say is a lie. They know they would not like to be black here. They know that. Now, they know that, and they're telling me lies. They're telling me and my children nothing but lies. When people talk about, you know, things that happened to black people, it wasn't that long ago. When James Baldwin was born in 1924, there were still thousands of people alive who were formerly enslaved. I mean, the last slave died in the 70s. So imagine what someone like James Baldwin or um, or, or Bayard Rustin were seeing in their childhoods with these people who were formerly enslaved and now now free people living in America. I, I can't even obviously I, I can't even imagine. I was born in the '80s, um, so I was born on you know about 15 years after the the last slave um, passed away the last enslaved um, African in America passed away. And when I say enslaved, I mean American chattel slavery. We all know that slavery was not abolished. It was conditional. Well, that's yeah, a, I mean, it was sort of blended in definitely. and we don't want to, We, you know, I, I know you know about this, but we don't want to, when we talk about the enslaved folks and when the last slaves were, you know, I mean, the, we don't want to gloss over the history of the Clotilda, which was the ship that came in with and with, a fresh batch of human beings that were sold into slavery um, after slavery had been abolished. Uh, and they came in in 1859 uh, and brought into a place called Africa Town um, in um, Alabama, I think. Um, Alabama. And yeah. near, where, near where the Alabama exactly. ball happened. And uh, and so you know, the, the chattel slavery was was doing its thing even after it wasn't supposed to be doing its thing. Um, and so we'll never know because there could have been another story like that, you know. 
That is true. You're yeah. absolutely right. Folks, drum Take roll. Away, Miss Major Griffin Gracie, uh, or Miss Major, is an author, an activist, Stonewall veteran, and a community organizer for trans rights. And Miss Major Griffin, she was born in the 1940s in Chicago, where she grew up on the South Side. She became involved early on with local drag balls and came out as transgender in the late 1950s. Trailblazer! Uh, after which her family kicked her out. Now, subsequently moving to New York City, where she integrated into the queer community uh, and shone and shined. Uh, when the Stonewall was in was raided in 1969, Miss Major was there meeting a friend and she joined the pursuing protests, was knocked unconscious by the police and awoke the next morning in jail. She would return to prison in the 1970s where placed with the men, she met leaders of the recent Attica riots uh, who would greatly influence her later work with the prison system. Miss Major moved to California in the late 1970s, eventually settling in San Francisco, just as the AIDS epidemic hit. She quickly dedicated herself to that cause, hiring other trans women to help take care of the sick and starting the Tenderloin AIDS Resource, Resource Center. In 2003, she joined the Transgender Gender Variant Intersex Justice Project before becoming its executive director. Miss Major Griffin Gracie has spent her entire life championing the queer community, particularly trans women of color in the prison system, and has earned a reputation as a pioneer, revolutionary, and adopted mother to many in our community. Everybody goes through a form of transitioning. Every straight motherfucker on to be breathing goes through it. Because when you're a teenager, you don't know who the hell you are, you don't know where you're going, you don't know what life's about, you know what, you're trying to understand your parents, forgetting that they were people before you were born, doing the same thing you're doing now, you know? And so in going through that and sorting that out, that's a transition for you. So why should yours be easy and mine be the most difficult thing in the world? So so, so basically, you know, when we do, um, which by the way, I, I probably should, I'm, I'm probably preempting this, but you know, we, we try to do these honors in uh, at Black Court Town Hall where we honor people who are working in entertainment, who are working in activism, and who have been working for Black excellence for years. And we try to, and we award them. We, we want to do, we're, we're going to do them live one day. I assure you, there will be an annual Black Court Town Hall honor celebration. We assure you. Um, but our most recent one was uh, Miss Major. And what a, treat and a joy and a wild ride getting to talk to Miss Major was, especially to see someone who is whose life life's work has been the advancement of uh, of uh trans people and the liberation of trans people through her not only her activism but her just constant um works. Yeah. The uh she she had a very insightful uh interview with us. Um and you know it was it's great to be able to to speak with someone who you know we would consider an elder for sure um a legend an icon and an elder who uh you, who has firsthand accounts of a lot of the the things that we think about when we think of uh the gay gay liberation movement the the more recent um historical strides that the that the queer community has made she was there for a lot of them and um, we were able to speak to her about those. And it's also great to hear from someone in that regard who also has a perspective on sort of what we're currently going through. And at the time when we interviewed her, uh, this was during the pandemic, sort of in the shadow and in the wake of the 2020, 2021 conversations about Black Lives Matter. And so that was great to sort of hear her perspective on that, her sort of perspective on modern day activism and the black the black struggle um in america the black american struggle um and so it was it was great to hear all that um and there's some wonderful outtakes that y'all will never get to hear that yeah <laughs> that's it <laughs> But also, um, by the way, a fun fact that um, in uh, 2021, Miss Major and um, and her partner Beck had a child, 
and and Ms. Major now has a lovely, beautiful uh, three year old, um, you mm-hmm. know, which is just so just wonderful, and and lets you know that um, you know there's there's always time to just you, you never it's never too late for something that's what i want to say it's never too late for something i just and i just i really love that for yeah. for me i remember seeing that announcement and being like oh my god this is so exciting this is so cool yeah i hope that she's able to enjoy <clears throat> some of the things that she was denied in all all those years over the last several many decades when she was devoting herself to our community um and yeah. we're um, what what is exciting to me is that maybe there maybe right now like there is someone who is being inspired in and activated by listening to a lot of the things that they hear and maybe even someone listening to this podcast right now who um is inspired into action uh to do great things for their community uh moving forward and and that's really kind of a special thing to think about hopefully it's happening yeah hopefully <laughs> um pep again i'm so glad that we get to have these uh do these episodes and get to maybe uh introduce some people to uh some of the wonderful icons who have paved the way for us to be able to live and there's more there's still more work to do and there's still icons in the making right now who are doing the work on this very day you know what i mean yeah. um shout out to queen jean um and you know we the the work is never done um and it's always important and with that i want to give a special thanks to our production team i'm executive producer tracy marquez senior producer charlene westbrook producer corey nixon and post producer amelia ritz holler and our music is by lefebvre thank you all for joining us today and if you got a chance to listen to this one and didn't listen to episode one of this series please go back and listen to that one because there's some other greats that you don't want to miss. So we'll see you next week. And of course, no, we did not, We these are not the only six queer cultural icons in the world, black queer cultural icons in the world. These are, we, 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 you know, obviously we, 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 this series could literally go on for until the end of the earth. Um, so comment below, let us know who are some people that, that, that you want to um, uplift, who are some people that you want to shine a light on. Much love everyone. <laughs>